As deaths worldwide continue to grow, we present a historical look at pandemics, specifically comparing the 1918 Spanish influenza and this year's COVID-19 crisis. Here now is Dr. Michael Warby, head of the University of Arizona's College of Science Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Hi, I'm Michael Warby. Uh, really happy to be here with you. And I wanna talk a little bit about the story of two pandemics, the one we're in the midst of right now, COVID-19, and the Spanish flu of 1918, uh, which is really the closest counterpart uh, of what we're experiencing now. You have to go back 100 years uh, to see something similar in human history. So the virus that causes COVID-19 is called SARS coronavirus 2. And it's SARS coronavirus 2 because it's so similar to a virus that emerged in 2002 and caused about a thousand deaths worldwide before the world was able to snuff it out through a combination of quarantining and, and testing for fevers at airports and, and this kind of thing. These viruses are natural viruses of, of bats, in particular horseshoe bats. And if you look in, in these wild animals, uh, you know, close to half of them look like uh, they've had experience with infection with, with similar viruses. So these viruses are out there. Uh, and the question is, why does uh, sometimes uh, they wh why do they sometimes jump from animals into humans? So when this virus started spreading, it was initially called 2019 NCOV novel coronavirus. And so just in terms of the, the history here, by the end of December, it was clear that something interesting was happening in, in Wuhan. There was a cluster of pneumonia cases, many of them linked to, to this seafood market shown here. And by January 10th, in a, in a real victory for science, we actually had isolated the virus uh, and, and sequenced the complete genome uh, of this new virus. Uh, and it's actually colleagues of mine uh, that I worked with in Oxford who were involved in that first genome sequencing. Uh, and that set the stage for everything uh, that's happened since. So as soon as we had a genome, we could start tracking the virus with the genomes of the virus, comparing and contrasting the, the different variants circulating in different parts of the world. And you could start making uh, vaccines, which are now in, in uh, late stage clinical trials. So by December, January 23rd, you had clear understanding that this was an emergency and the Chinese government actually shut down Wuhan and eventually the whole province uh, or most of the province of Hubei in a really unprecedented uh, quarantine event. And by the end of January, WHO had, had declared this a global health emergency. Uh, and it was clear to all of us who, who work in this area uh, that we had, uh, you know, the makings of, of the next 1918 flu-like pandemic on our hands. So fast forward now, or change venues now from China to the US. We knew that this virus was spreading. We knew that there was the possibility of the virus moving from China to other countries, including the US. And, and a real turning point came right around mid-January. When, when the very first case uh, of this virus was detected in a person in the States. This guy had traveled from Wuhan to SeaTac Airport uh, near Seattle and started feeling poorly. He was aware that uh, the CDC had mentioned that there was this new pneumonia in Wuhan and if you do feel poorly to, to consider getting tested. Uh, so he went and got tested and sure enough had the virus the CDC sequenced the genome of this virus, uh, of the virus from this individual. Uh, and then uh, the race was on to try to contact everyone he had been in contact with, isolate him so that the, the virus wasn't passed on to others. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a, a local link to this. One of the graduate students in my department uh, was actually on the same plane uh, as that first patient and he was contacted by the public health officials in Washington state uh, and asked if he had been feeling ill. And so they did a, a, a really good job uh, uh, in Washington state of kind of doing all of the right things, finding who has the virus, uh, finding who they may have infected, uh, 
and then trying to isolate anyone who's infected or, or, or thought to be infected. Okay, so this is, it was January 19th that this guy uh, was diagnosed. Six weeks then go past, six absolutely crucial weeks in, in this country go past while everyone is wondering, did this guy establish a chain of infection? Are other people traveling from China or other countries bringing the virus in and starting little clusters in the community that we just don't know about yet? And right at the end of February, researchers up in Washington state found another person in the community with no known travel links to China who had the virus. They sequenced the genome from this guy and lo and behold, it was almost identical to the virus uh, from the January patient who had traveled from Wuhan. Uh, and so for me as an evolutionary biologist, uh, that was an absolutely uh, uh, earth shattering finding because what it suggested was that these six weeks that had gone past uh, had actually been a six week period of cryptic transmission, the relationship between those two genomes suggested that that first patient actually had infected other th others in the community uh, and that the virus had been spreading under the radar for six weeks. Uh, so, so this New York Times article kind of captures uh, the, the event. And this was really one of the huge turning points where people got this wake up call that, holy crap, we might be six weeks into this thing rather than still trying to find the odd person uh, who's uh, infected. And so my initial take on this research that others uh, up in Seattle had done was that it was, there was a very solid case that that first patient really had brought the virus in and that's how the pandemic had started in the US. Uh, but the more I started analyzing these uh, genome sequences of the virus, and getting a feel for how it evolves, the more I started to think, you know, those two viruses, the one in January and the one in late February, they're not actually exactly identical. There's a couple differences uh, between them uh, and, and two mutations out of 30,000 nucleotides in a genome sequence it doesn't sound like much, but for an RNA virus, uh, this virus kind of evolves pretty slowly, about one mutation every two weeks. And so those two mutations different uh, started making me think, you know, we need to think more carefully about whether this January patient really was the source of the North American epidemic. Uh, and so uh, I went at it uh, with, with colleagues from uh, several institutions around the world in a couple different ways. First, we simulated uh, the epidemic uh, under the constraint that, you know, what if that patient in Washington uh, state in mid-January, what if that patient really did start the outbreak? If we take his virus and then allow it to spread in the, in the Seattle area for six weeks, do we then see a pattern uh, like the one that we observe in the real data? Uh, and we also took these genome sequences and we make these family trees, these evolutionary trees out of, uh, out of them. And we folded in not only the genetic information, but also information about uh, how many people were infected in different parts of the world and, and potentially hopping on planes, uh, passenger air flows between different cities, uh, to try to get a sort of holistic picture of, you know, is this really how it started? Or did this outbreak in Washington uh, that was detected in February actually start a little later? Uh, and what we found, and this was published recently, uh, uh, is that the epidemic actually uh, almost certainly didn't start with that uh, patient in Washington state. It started a little later. I won't subject you to too many really technical uh, analyses here, but just to give you a very quick uh, glimpse uh, of the sort of family trees of these viruses that we make, up in the top right here, we have this cluster uh, of viruses that we, we see in Washington state from February and March. Uh, 
And they're actually distinct on the family tree from way down at the bottom left, you can see this WA1. That was that first patient uh, in January in Washington. Uh, and so th this tells us that the Washington outbreak didn't get started right away in, in January before we really had any opportunity to, to roll out testing. It got started a little bit later from an independent movement of the virus from China. And this starts to become really crucial uh, because, uh, you know, the, the U.S. Was, was, was a country uh, that wasn't able to stop uh, the incursion uh, of, of this viruses, but other countries did. South Korea, for example, Iceland did a good job. Um, uh, and so take South Korea, for example. South Korea had a lot of introductions of the virus, uh, like the U.S., from people traveling from China, but they very quickly rolled out genetic testing to try to find people in the community who were infected uh, and then isolate them from, from others. And this is still something, you know, close to a year into this outbreak in the U.S. Uh, that we're struggling with. Very quickly, um, I just want to touch on the European side of pandemic where we, we've also pinned down how that originated. And it's a sort of similar story where there, where there was speculation that the pandemic had started in Germany uh, with an early outbreak in, uh, in January. That outbreak had been very uh, efficiently uh, tackled with, with testing, tracing, and isolation of patients. But a few weeks later in, in Northern Italy, uh, when the virus was clearly spreading out of control there, uh, people speculated that, you know, that German outbreak, we must not have actually snuffed it out. It must have been circulating under the radar and, and spread to Italy. Our research shows, no, again, the Italian outbreak actually started from an independent movement of the virus, probably in late January from China. Uh, that outbreak then uh, spread all across Europe in a very uncontrolled fashion. Uh, and while we were kind of in the US looking west to China to try to stop the virus from entering, uh, that European outbreak uh, virus was moving from Europe to the east coast uh, of the US. And now in, uh, uh, in Tucson, for example, all of uh, the virus that we're sequencing appears to trace back to this European branch of the evolutionary tree, and this West Coast Washington State uh, outbreak uh, has gone extinct. So back to this patient uh, in January in, uh, in Washington State, who almost went down in history as, as the sort of patient zero of uh, the COVID-19 outbreak in, in the U.S. Uh, one of the things that uh, is kind of gratifying in, in, in doing this kind of research and showing that, no, you're, you're pointing to the wrong person there, and that's not how it happened. Uh, and indeed, it probably or, or may not have even been uh, a Chinese national who brought that virus to Washington state. Uh, there were 40,000 people uh, who traveled from China back to the U.S., uh, American citizens and, and visa holders, after the ban on, uh, on most travel from China was put in place. And the timing of this event suggests it could have been one of them. Uh, and, and so this kind of has a, a connection uh, to other research I've done on the origin of HIV, where we sequenced the complete genome of so-called patient zero, who'd kind of gone down in the history as this uh, uh, villain who spread the virus from coast to coast or even introduced HIV uh, to the U.S., uh, we were able to show that that wasn't the case. He was just one of many people infected. Uh, and another link to the current research is to do that work and piece together the genome of the virus from that individual and other uh, old archival samples where the genetic information is kind of damaged and decayed. Uh, we developed techniques in my lab, uh, in particular my lab manager, Tom Watts, uh, to, 
amplify very tiny little fragments of, of even a very damaged genome and then stitch them back together into a complete genomic sequence. Uh, more than 100,000 complete genomes of SARS coronavirus 2 have now been sequenced, and most of them have been uh, uh, sequenced using the, the techniques pioneered in our lab. So our work uh, on, on the origins uh, and spread of uh, HIV d did show something very interesting. Uh, and uh, and what, what that was, was that although the, the virus and the syndrome became recognized in the early 80s, when you analyze the gene sequences uh, of the viruses and make these evolutionary trees, you can calibrate what we call a molecular clock uh, of the virus. Um, with samples taken at different time points, you can actually sort of in real human time calculate how many mutations accumulate per year. Uh, when you then look at the evolutionary tree, you can count how many mutations must have occurred to get back to what we call the root of the tree, the point from which all of the viruses uh, diversified. Uh, and in the US, it's, it's clear that this virus, uh, and this was a surprise to my colleagues in the field initially, but has been uh, uh, very widely accepted now. HIV was actually spreading under the radar for a full 10 years uh, before it was, uh, anyone noticed that there was a problem. Uh, and so I, I'm gonna talk a little bit toward the end of the talk uh, about how long uh, the current virus might have been circulating under the rad radar, how long the 1918 flu might have been circulating under the radar. Uh, but these genomic sequences uh, that we generate uh, are, are, it's kind of like uh, using uh, the, the virus uh, as a weapon against itself. The, the genome contains clues uh, that we can use to understand how these pandemics take shape, take hold, spread or don't spread, depending on uh, the different measures that are employed. Uh, and we've done that here in Arizona uh, as well. So, so we've, we've generated complete genome sequences from, from many patients uh, here in Tucson. Uh, I've also collaborated with others uh, at uh, NAU and, and TGen North and Flagstaff and, and people at ASU. Uh, and we've, we've sort of put together all of our resources to get the best picture of uh, what's happening with this pandemic of COVID-19, specifically in Arizona. When did the outbreak start here? How many sources uh, were there? Uh, and uh, what we found, and, and this was in, in the STAR uh, recently, uh, uh, and my grad students, Brendan Larson and Grace uh, Quirk, have, have, have done a huge amount of work generating and analyzing these sequences. Um, what we found is the, the epidemic probably really didn't get started uh, in a big way in Arizona uh, until sometime in February. There was a very similar uh, patient uh, in uh, Arizona to the one in Washington State. Uh, diagnosed with the virus just a few days later than the, the, the one in Washington State and the student at ASU. There again, public health authorities seem to have done a really good job of isolating that patient uh, and, and preventing that early arrival of the virus in Arizona from spreading. So one of the first things I wanted to do once we got a number of, of genome sequences from uh, Arizona was to look on the evolutionary tree and, and ask, okay, did that guy uh, who brought the virus in, uh, you know, inadvertently uh, to, uh, to Arizona in January, was that the start of the outbreak in, in Arizona? And the answer was a very clear no, that the, that virus is off on a branch uh, uh, with other sequences from, of the virus from, from China, not at all similar to anything else we've found in Arizona. So we think the virus, the virus has clearly arrived multiple times um, uh, in Arizona. Uh, and, and as I mentioned before, currently the viruses that dominate in the state are the ones that moved from China to Northern Italy late January, and then from Europe 
to the East Coast uh, of the US probably in February. Uh, and, and they've now uh, taken over uh, in, in our state. Okay, so now let's switch gears, uh, go back more than 100 years uh, to the, the 1918 flu pandemic. Uh, and in terms of comparing and contrasting, one of the interesting things is just how little an impact that incredibly devastating pandemic uh, made historically. So for many, many decades after the pandemic, it really wasn't talked about. There, there are very few uh, uh, works uh, of literature that, uh, that even sort of uh, talk about the 1918 flu. Um, and it wasn't really until the 1970s that historians kind of rediscovered this uh, event. You know, it w obviously wasn't completely forgotten, but in the public consciousness, it, was, it, was, it had really receded. Uh, and this historian, uh, Alfred Crosby, uh, wrote a book that helped kind of wake the world back up to this event that happened uh, in, in our history. Uh, and actually he came about, he, he was uh, killing time before giving a seminar uh, and was in a room that had almanacs and he pulled the almanac from 1917 off the wall and looked up uh, average, the life expectancy was about 52 in 1917. 1990, uh, 19, it was about 52, pulled the one from 1918 off the shelf, uh, and it had dropped in that one year by 10 years to 42. And so his question was, what the hell happened? And that was his introduction to this event uh, uh, that had killed so many people. And so, <clears throat> The 1918 flu is very similar uh, to SARS-CoV-2 that causes uh, COVID-19. These are both respiratory viruses that have jumped uh, into the human population from animal reservoirs where they circulate naturally and thankfully don't often make that jump successfully. The Spanish flu, uh, current estimates suggest, killed something like 50 million people. Uh, most of them in, in sort of the fall semester uh, of, of 1918, a little bit uh, into, into 1918. And at a time when the U.S. population was a, less than a third of what it is now, uh, this virus killed 675,000 people uh, in the U.S. And when you look at the virus, uh, it probably had uh, an infection fatality rate of about 1%. And let me just clarify what I mean by infection fatality rate, because early on in the pandemic, we heard a lot about the case fatality rate. Uh, and, and, and the case fatality rate, uh, a, a case of this virus is, uh, is someone um, who you know is infected with it, typically because they're symptomatic. But because some people can be asymptomatic uh, or are never diagnosed, uh, the case number is kind of the tip of the iceberg and then the base of the iceberg uh, are these hidden infections. So early on, uh, the estimates of the case fatality rate uh, of this virus uh, were very high, uh, sort of around uh, 5% initially uh, in, in uh, data coming out of China. Um, and for elderly people in particular, if you're over 85, the case fatality rate estimates uh, were north of, of 15%, uh, which is uh, about as bad as R Russian roulette. Thankfully, uh, the infection fatality rate, if you tally up all of those hidden infections where people don't get as sick, um, that's, that's lower, but it's still probably something around 1% for the current virus, just like it was for the 1918 virus. And that is why uh, these lockdown measures, social distancing, mask wearing, all of the efforts to test and trace uh, and isolate people that we're doing matters a great deal. 
uh, because it's, it's quite clear that if you just allowed this current virus to sweep across the country and the world without putting up these sorts of defenses, which was largely what had to happen in 1918 because uh, the world uh, just didn't have the option of, of locking down in the same way that it does now. Um, if, uh, if the current outbreak was, was just allowed to sweep through the population until it had infected everyone, which is exactly what happened over the course of a couple of years with Spanish flu, um, it probably is the case that you would be looking, counting in the millions, the number of, uh, of deaths. Uh, and if you think about it now, in the US, we're still only at, you know, maybe 10% of the population having been infected. Uh, and we've already got, uh, had more than 200,000 deaths. So a little arithmetic uh, uh, <clears throat> indicates, again, that the number of people who could die from this virus if we don't fight it uh, is, is astronomical. Okay, comparing uh, the two viruses, uh, this is something that's kind of close to, close to my heart because um, I have been fascinated for many years by the pattern of uh, death rate by age uh, group uh, for the 1918 virus. Uh, so flu viruses uh, typically um, uh, hit the elderly very, very hard. They also hit uh, very young people quite hard. Uh, and this graph here um, shows across the horizontal axis at the bottom, you have different age groups, one to four year olds, five to 14 year olds, uh, and so on. The dashed line shows uh, the, the death rate in each age group for influenza leading up to the pandemic in 1918. So this would be just sort of your typical seasonal flu like we, uh, like we deal with year to year now, not a new virus that's jumped in from the animal reservoir to which people don't have immunity. Uh, and so in that dashed line, you can see, yeah, flu hits you know, babies. Uh, it can be dangerous for babies who have no immunity. It's very dangerous uh, for elderly people uh, whose immune systems uh, are, uh, are in some ways um, worn down or so kind of used up by previous um, uh, exposure uh, uh, to, to different pathogens that they have a harder time making a new immune response to something. Uh, but the solid line shows what happened in 1918, uh, where you have deaths in the elderly and in younger age groups, but you have this really surprising bump up in deaths uh, in people in young adulthood, 20, 20 to 40, peaking right around age 28. Uh, and so for 100 years, the question has been, what's up with that? Why, why did the 1918 Spanish flu kill young adults, people, you know, thought of as being in the prime of, uh, of life. Um, compare that to COVID-19, uh, where, you know, there's a lot of horrible things about this virus, uh, and it is absolutely devastating uh, for uh, older folks, uh, for people with some pre-existing um, conditions, uh, like hypertension, uh, obesity, uh, and it's hitting uh, certain groups, uh, uh, African Americans, uh, Hispanics, uh, Native Americans, uh, in particular uh, early on here in Arizona, um, very hard. What it's not doing is killing those young adults uh, in, in the numbers that we saw in, in the 1918 virus. It's also not killing even the very youngest uh, kids in the same way that flu has. Uh, and, and here at the Air, uh, University of Arizona, uh, we're actually well uh, situated to kind of lead the world in, in understanding what's going on with this age-related uh, bias in, in death rate. Uh, we have people like Janko Nikolic, who's the head of the Department of Immunobiology, 
who's really uh, the leading person in the world uh, in understanding aging and how that affects our T cells, which are these kind of Pac-Man-like uh, cells that eat up uh, uh, cells that are infected with viruses. Uh, and this is almost certainly a key part of what's going on uh, with COVID. Um, but a question that I have and that, uh, that I'm looking at with, uh, with Yanko uh, and with Deepta Bhattacharya, another professor in immunobiology who is, is uh, uh, one of the very top people in the world understanding the other arm of the adaptive immune system that makes antibodies. Um, we're, we're looking at not only the patterns of, of, of how age uh, affects our immune responses, but also what about prior exposure to similar viruses? So we've all actually had coronavirus infections, all of us who are older than about one year old. Uh, we've had coronavirus infections. There are multiple human coronaviruses that cause about 20% of uh, what we call the common cold. Um, and they share some similarity antigenically. So anti antigen just means uh, the part of a, a virus that our immune system can see and lock onto. Uh, there are enough similarities between the, the human common cold causing coronaviruses and the new coronavirus to ask, um, you know, is, is prior immunity actually protecting some people? Is that why some people do better than others? Um, is prior immunity actually causing problems where the antibodies uh, can stick to the virus uh, and then act like a kind of Velcro that uh, glue the, the virus infected cells uh, onto other cells and allow viruses to infect new cells? Um, but the reason I want to tackle this with COVID-19 is because this has turned out to be uh, a really um, uh, fascinating issue with flu. Uh, and so I came at this again as an evolutionary biologist, just trying to figure out where did this 1918 virus come from? Uh, there's eight sort of chromosomes that make up its genome. Uh, you know, where did they come from? Uh, we were able to show that uh, Seven of those eight almost certainly jumped from birds in North America just prior uh, to, to 1918. But one of them, the very important H or uh, hemagglutinin component, which is one of these key antigens that the immune system recognizes, uh, it looks like the 1918 virus actually inherited that from an earlier seasonal uh, flu virus that had already been circulating for uh, 10 or 15 years. And to, to kind of cut to the chase, let me show you this graph uh, that depicts uh, in, in the gray line, the mortality rate uh, of different age groups. So on the horizontal axis here, I'm showing uh, birth year. Uh, slash age. So right in the middle, you have people born around 1890. They're 28 years old in 1918. If you were 28 years old in 1918, you had this astounding high death uh, chance of dying from the flu. Uh, it turns out that those uh, same people as kids had been exposed to just the wrong kind of flu virus. Uh, the, these flu viruses come in these various flavors, H1N1, H3N2, and so forth. Uh, and, and we think that the previous flu pandemic, uh, the so-called Russian flu of, 19, uh, of 1889 to uh, uh, 1890, we think that was an H3 virus. And on the evolutionary tree of these viruses, uh, H3 is over on one branch, H1 is over on another branch. The 1918 virus was an H1 virus. And so what it looked like in, uh, uh, in 1918 was that if you were older or younger than 28, there was a good chance as a kid that you had something that was antigenically quite similar to the H1 virus uh, of 1918. 
and you were able to recall a response that was somewhat protective. If you were right in that little wedge uh, of, of people peaking in, uh, at age 28, uh, your first exposure was to the wrong kind of uh, virus. Uh, and compared to everyone else, uh, it looks like uh, your immune system was kind of trapped into something called original antigenic sin, which is uh, just a colorful uh, way uh, of, uh, of saying that your immune system preferentially recalls uh, antibodies to, to, to things that you were exposed to early in, early in life. Uh, and so, so this explains a lot about what happened in 1918, which again had been a real big mystery for, for 100 years. Uh, uh, and, and we kind of pieced it together here at the University of Arizona. So th th this, this story of uh, what happened in 1918 has kind of snowballed into a bigger thing. Um, as I was finishing up the work on 1918, uh, I started thinking about these avian origin viruses like H5N1 that you may have heard about, H7N9. These are viruses circulating in birds that are sporadically jumping into humans uh, and killing a lot of people, uh, hundreds and hundreds of people. These are the viruses that we're looking to as possible next flu pandemic viruses. They haven't established human-to-human uh, -human transmission, uh, but if they do, they seem to kill a high proportion of, of people. As I was finishing that 1918 uh, flu work and thinking about how this first imprinting that we all have with our very first exposure to flu seems to set us up to either be very good at protecting ourselves against viruses somewhat similar to the first childhood virus, or kind of bad uh, if the virus uh, is, is quite distantly related to the first virus you had as a kid. I started thinking about the age groups who were dying from these two viruses. Uh, H5N1 uh, mostly kills younger people, uh, and H7N9 mostly kills older people. Uh, and scientists had been tying themselves in knots trying to figure out uh, why this is. You know, are, are, are kids somehow exposed to, to birds with H5N1 more often, and, and older people to birds infected with H7N9. Nothing seemed to make much sense. Um, but I looked at it from this same perspective of, okay, let's go back in time. We know which viruses, uh, which flu viruses have been circulating from 1918 onward in the human population. Uh, so if you were born in uh, 1950, for example, I can tell you that your first childhood infection was with an H1N1 virus. Uh, that is quite closely related to H5N1 viruses. Uh, if you were born in 1970, I can tell you your first virus, uh, flu virus, uh, was an H3N2 virus, uh, and that's most similar to, very similar to the H7N9 avian virus. And so it turns out, uh, and and. This is slightly complex, um, but I want to just uh, give you a flavor of what we see here. So in, in, in the it turns out that uh, if you look at who's dying from these two different forms of virus that are jumping from birds, uh, it seems to be extremely dominated by age. Uh, so these blue viruses, uh, H5N1, in the top right, you can see that most people dying from H5N1 uh, are younger, born uh, after about 1968. Little bit messier for the red viruses, these H7N9s, uh, but most people dying from those viruses uh, were born before 1968 and are, are a, a little bit older. Um, in the bottom, if you then just sort of correct for um, if for a given slice of the population, for people who were born in 1950, uh, and we look at each of those viruses, are we seeing more deaths than expected just by the, the, the proportion uh, of the population that that uh, age group birth year makes up? Uh, or are we seeing fewer deaths than expected? 
Uh, and you see this kind of mirror image where 1968 is this dividing line where for one kind of virus, if you were born before 1968 and you're infected by it, it's your lucky day. You've got great immunity from your childhood infection that you can draw upon. You're probably not gonna die. You might get infected, but you're probably not gonna die. But if you get, in, get infected with the other virus, the one that's different than the one you had as a kid, unfortunately, then you're in that high risk age group uh, where you're quite likely to have severe symptoms or, or die. Um, and, and so this is turning out to be a, a major uh, foundation of, of how we're now thinking about how flu kills uh, and importantly, how we can use that information uh, to protect ourselves in, in the future. Uh, and so this idea of antigenic imprinting where that first virus infection uh, and your immune system memory that you carry through your whole life um, uh, sort of determines or shapes the, the severity of infections uh, after that. Uh, th this is now a sort of cornerstone uh, of strategies to develop universal flu vaccines. Uh, and, and, and here's a paper by Tony Fauci that we've all seen in the news talking about COVID, uh, but he's also um, uh, as the head of uh, the, the the part of the National Institutes of Health that deals with infectious disease, his strategic plan for how to create the next generation of, of flu vaccines, a big component of, of it is uh, trying to draw on this understanding uh, of uh, uh, antigenic imprinting that's come out of our work here at the University of Arizona. Uh, this, this work is now, uh, my, my work on this uh, is, is funded by the Gates Foundation, um, uh, and we're trying to uh, draw on this knowledge. And one idea that I've had is that maybe the way forward with flu, um, since, since we seem to have great immunity to about half of the evolutionary tree and poor immunity to the other half of the evolutionary tree of these viruses, since we all have initial infections by you know, one or the other main kind of, of these uh, flu viruses. Maybe the thing to do is if we could uh, immunize children before their first natural first exposure to flu and simultaneously introduce both types, uh, which current flu vaccines actually conveniently contain both types, um, we think that actually might uh, reshape immunity for the lifetime of those individuals. And we're kind of excited about uh, seeing uh, uh, if, if this can open new doors to protecting against flu. Uh, okay, so, so let's now, uh, having sort of talked about the, the biology of both SARS-CoV-2 uh, and influenza, uh, and with a little bit of comparing and contrasting. Um, so, so one interesting difference in the world now compared to the world in 1918 uh, is uh, in 1918, uh, the world was just winding up uh, the Great War, uh, World War I. Uh, and, and there was a massive movement of people uh, at the end of World War I, back to their home countries uh, uh, in a way that is almost, if you think about it, the polar opposite uh, of what we did during this uh, outbreak, which was to, in a, in a way that was just would have been inconceivable uh, even in January of this year, we've shut travel between countries. We've, you know, there's, it started with uh, uh, the, the ban on uh, uh, travelers from China. Uh, eventually, uh, it, it extended uh, with a ban on travel uh, uh, from uh, Europe or, or restrictions uh, would be a more accurate way to say it. This was not done in 1918. And what you saw in 1918 uh, in places like Philadelphia that were very hard hit by the 1918 virus, those outbreaks um, were in, in the general population were preceded by a, a few weeks 
by outbreaks in uh, members of the military uh, who had returned uh, from World War I. Uh, and, and so we think that um, uh, that may have had a, a major impact on exacerbating uh, that ep ep uh, ep outbreak that killed 50 million people. And there's just a, a sort of visual reference of the kind of uh, perfect conditions for uh, spreading and transporting uh, viruses that we're trying to avoid now. Uh, another uh, difference here, um, again, I mentioned that in some ways for decades after World War, uh, after the Spanish flu that killed more people than World War I had, uh, people didn't talk about it much. It, w it just wasn't at the forefront of, of, of people's mind. Uh, and I don't think we're ever uh, going to um, have anything similar with, with COVID-19. Uh, it's a time of uh, uh, almost information overload uh, in, in some ways. And, and it's just interesting to think about the psychological impact uh, that this virus is having um, compared to the Spanish flu which kind of, again, kind of washed over the population. And then uh, people went on, those who survived, uh, tried to go on with life and, and not think about it too much. Um, but, but I wanted to touch on the, the name Spanish flu. Uh, the one thing we know about the Spanish flu is that it didn't come from Spain. Uh, it, it actually was called the Spanish flu simply because uh, Spain was not a belligerent in World War I and did not have tight press censorship. Uh, other countries uh, were trying to use the government. The government was actually trying to um, censor anything that could be perceived as bad news that would sap morale. Uh, and, uh, and Spain was not doing that. And so early reports of uh, of people dying from this virus came out of Spain and, and, and the name kind of stuck. Uh, so again, I've, I've touched on those uh, uh, travel restrictions. Um, and, uh, and thought I would also mention just how different uh, the situation is now with this new virus in terms of our scientific uh, capacities. So again, end of December, it's pretty clear that there's a new disease in town. January 10th, we have the virus identified, cultured, which just means grown in, in cells, and sequenced. We know the whole genome of, of, of this thing. Now go back to 1918. In 1918, people actually didn't even know that the, the flu was caused by a virus. Uh, the received wisdom was that it was caused by a bacterium called Pfeiffer's bacillus. And it wasn't until decades later that the virus was isolated and, and we understood that it, this was a, a viral epidemic. So we have tools now and an ability to move from genome sequence to vaccines, uh, which are really going to transform things, uh, I think, in the next uh, few months here. Uh, I, I do think that we will have effective vaccines, safe vaccines. Um, there's more of a question of, uh, can we manufacture and distribute enough of those vaccines in a timely way to protect people uh, in the US and around the world? Uh, but we're, we're in a much different and, and better position compared to the 1918 um, uh, situation. Uh, again, lockdowns. Back in, in the winter of 2020, uh, I don't know about you, but to me, uh, it seemed just unbelievable that a city of 11 million people had been locked down by the Chinese uh, government. And I remember thinking, uh, yeah, only in an authoritarian uh, regime like China could you possibly do this. Fast forward just a few weeks, uh, Italy be uh, was locked down. Um, uh, we have all these travel restrictions. We are doing things uh, now on a large scale that have always, for, for millennia, have been part of our arsenal against infectious disease. Uh, and we're doing them in a bigger way than was done in 1918. And that is a huge reason why uh, we 
only uh, have had 200,000 plus uh, deaths so far uh, from this uh, disease. So let's now just kind of take things back to the kind of ultimate comparison here. Uh, in 1918, something like 50 million people died. So far with COVID-19, about a million people have died worldwide, uh, which is horrible. Uh, but putting it in perspective, um, although we've bungled a lot of things, uh, we've done some things right and slowed this down. And you know, even something just as simple as everyone wearing masks, this is what is making the difference uh, here and, and can buy us time until we have uh, vaccines. Uh, and, uh, and, and of course, uh, in doing so, we also save our economy. The more we uh, uh, wear those masks and, and keep this from becoming a, a, a disaster like 1918. Um, but just look at those numbers for the US. Uh, at a time when the population was less than a third of what it was now, 675,000 people died in the US, um, which was 1.3% um, of that total uh, that, that died worldwide. Uh, for COVID-19, we're already north of 200,000, um, and that's 21% of the total number that have died worldwide at a time when the US accounts for less of the total worldwide population. Uh, and, and so um, th this is really uh, hundreds of thousands of people that did not need to die. Uh, and in many ways, I think we're gonna look back uh, on, on this uh, and look at those weeks uh, between January uh, and February of 2020 uh, as a golden opportunity uh, that, that we lost uh, and allowed this virus to spin out of control. I'm Michael Warby, head of the University of Arizona's Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and Associate Director of Bio5. I just wanna thank you very much for joining this discussion uh, of two pandemics, COVID-19 and the 1918 Spanish flu. Thank you so much, stay well. Mm -hmm.